good afternoon everybody on behalf of uh, department of pathology and uh, neurology i welcome you all to this month cpc and uh, today today discusser is uh, professor manish modi i welcome you sir for this cpc thank you sir he has uh, joined as a dm neurology in 2000 and then he became uh, assistant professor and associate professor then now he is professor of neurology his main interest is in the tropical neurology in cns infections and the geriatric neurology he is member of uh, many academies he is fellow of many academies and has more than 2200 publications to his credit He is a member of uh, many professional bodies, and uh, I hope uh, he will. Uh, this topic is for uh, of his choice as infection of uh, neurology. So may I invite uh, Professor Modi for to discuss the case. Thank you have thirty thirty five minutes, Thanks. and then we will have discussion, and then the pathology. Right, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, and uh, thank you the neurology and pathology team of uh, Ames, and uh, thanks for. Uh, um, can we stop the screen share from your end? Okay, sir. Okay. 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 okay we are start now sir so first of all uh, uh, i must thank uh, the uh, neurology department of aims for uh, uh, for uh, asking me to present this wonderful cpc uh, i will say that uh, it's an honor for the department of neurology pga uh, department of radio diagnosis and department of nuclear medicine who together you know um, try to uh, unwind all the problems which were faced uh, during life in this patient the radiology was quite exhaustive thousands and thousands of pictures were there so i had been very selective in choosing few of them please excuse me for that because the radiology itself may take one and a half to two hours if we want to discuss it really properly you know it is full of so much of information that we, that i really learned a lot from this radiology but i'll be sh uh, sharing some uh, salient features from the radiology which were done at different times in this patient so on behalf of department of neurology i am presenting uh, uh, pj chandigarh and presenting a young male who presented to aims new delhi uh, last year with multiple cranial epilepsies so coming to the timeline this patient uh, uh, was having symptoms from march 2018 right that was the first time when he presented with history of uh, um, some pain on the right half of the face and which gradually progressed to numbness of the right half of the face so within one month this patient started with you know some kind of irritation of the fifth nerve and um, uh, then it is followed by the damage to the fifth nerve and this was also accompanied by diplopia meaning there bad that either the adjoining nerves in the third or sixth or third fourth and sixth were involved along with the fifth nerve and then within another one month the patient noticed reduced movement of the right eye meaning there bad that uh, the right eye was completely frozen so it could be because of the third fourth sixth uh, uh, nerve involvement or because of uh, the disease pathology in the orbit that we will see but there is no proptosis or chemosis so i attribute it to the the cranial nerves in addition patient also noticed vision loss in the right eye meaning thereby that the 
right second nerve is also afflicted in this patient. And subsequently, patient had bilateral hearing loss. So it is not uh, uh, properly noted whether it was a sensory neural kind of a hearing loss or it was a conductive hearing loss, but uh, uh, it appeared, uh, but there was definite hearing loss on the right side, on the same side where all the nerves were involved. And um, subsequently over next two months, the patient also had deviation of mouth and difficulty closing right eye, meaning thereby that the seventh nerve is also involved along with the eighth nerve. So I Sorry, I have to um, re-share. Am I audible now, ma'am? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, sorry for that uh, interruption. So, this patient had uh, Probably multiple cranial nerve palsies from all involving on the right side. And sorry to interrupt, your screen is not shared. Yeah. Your screen is not shared. Okay. Ah, oh, it's okay. Fine. So, so this patient had uh, uh, multiple cranial nerve palsies, which uh, started in the fifth nerve distribution and then progressively involved all the cranial nerves, right from second, third, fourth, sixth, uh, fifth, seventh, eighth. And um, so with these complaints, almost more than uh, one year and four months after these symptoms, uh, the patient was admitted in Ames, New Delhi, and uh, uh, when uh, the patient was admitted in end June and in the first week of July, the uh, it was noticed that there was no fever or loss of appetite or loss of weight, and um, there were no joint pains, oral ulcers or rashes, and there was no history of any connective tissue disorder in the past. There was no chronic cough or breathlessness to suggest, you know, any connective tissue disorder, sarcoidosis, vasculitis or any similar sustaining complaint. And um, patient uh, on examination, the chest and CVS was normal. There was no organomegaly or any lymphadenopathy. The higher mental functions were essentially normal and there was no motor sensory or cerebellar deficit. And examination did reveal evidence of second to eighth cranial nerve. In addition, it was found that the ninth and 10th nerves were also involved along with the 12th nerve. There is no mention of the 11th nerve in this uh, in the notes. But uh, it was also seen that there was subtle involvement of the left, fifth, and eighth nerve also in this patient, and there were no meningeal signs. So with this database, the patient was, so there was multiple cranial nerve palsies, there was no intraaxial uh, localization, and uh, possibly there was some lesion in the, uh, in the base of the Skull, uh, base of the brain in the skull or in the dura mater. And the uh, patient had already had uh, MRI uh, done in May and he was admitted in June, which was showing, uh, if we can appreciate, there is, this is 32 flare, there is a lesion in the medial part, in the lateral part of the right cavern sinus, if we can appreciate, there is a hypointense lesion which is extending through the superior orbital fissure into the, uh, into the uh, orbit on the medial side involving the medial rectus muscle also. In addition, we can see there are certain changes in the lateral aspect. They are more likely the changes in the temporalis muscle possibly related to the denervation which the patient might have been experiencing. In addition, one can see subtle uh, temporal lobe changes also. And if we look carefully, there is uh, extension of this disease process uh, in front of the temporal lobes also in this patient, if we can appreciate in this uh, coronal section. And uh, on contrast, this was moderate 
to there was a moderate to intense enhancement of this soft tissue lesion, which is also encasing the internal carotid artery, if we can appreciate on the right side. And then this uh, dural based lesion is also extending anteriorly to the in front of the temporal lobe. And if we can carefully notice, there is some temporal bone changes also in this patient on the right side, in addition to the, uh, you know, the contrast enhancement, which is going right into the orbital apex. But please note that the nasals, paranasal sinuses, they are normal. The sphenoid is essentially normal as the ethmoids and maxillary sinuses are essentially normal. So there doesn't seem to be uh, any uh, 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 any, I mean, say, uh, direct link between the sinuses and this lesion, which we are appreciating even on the coronal sections also. But it is also worth noting that there is some contrast enhancement um, in the infratemporal region also, which probably I'll be discussing uh, later on. Probably that disease process was following some of the foramina in the base of the skull and was trying to enter into the uh, infratemporal region and afflicting the muscles infratemporally. So, and uh, on the bone cuts, if we can appreciate, there is otomastoiditis on the right side. Uh, I feel it is important. We'll be discussing in the end once again. And uh, there is... Uh, uh, bony change, if you can appreciate, there is some sclerosis of the bone here in front of the temporal lobe. And if we can see lower down, then this phenoid wing, the, uh, this phenoid wing and the base of the skull is showing extensive sclerosis compared to the right side. I hope we are able to appreciate it in addition to the otomastoiditis, which I already pointed out. And there is some fluid uh, uh, in the spinoid sinus. And uh, at best, this is what I can show in this, at this point of time in 2019 CT head when the patient was admitted. So with an enhancing dura, extensively enhancing dural based pathology, the patient was admitted and was extensively investigated the hemogram was essentially normal. The back chemistry was normal. And the, all the vasculitic workup, RF, ANA, ANCA, everything was negative. The connective tissue workup was negative. The ACE levels were normal. The IgG4 levels were done, thinking of a hypertrophic pachymeningitis of IgG4 origin. That was also normal. The patient underwent CSF, uh, um, uh, CSF analysis and only one CSF was done, which was negative for um, fungal, were negative for fungal workup, for tubercular workup, and fungal for cryptococcal, and also negative for malignant cytology, but it was done only once. And um, it does have some lymphocytic pleocytosis, mildly reduced, almost 50% sugars, and the no proteins were normal. So essentially not showing any aggressive infection, at least um, uh, in the um, meninges initially, though there may be subtle you know, involvement, uh, something like um, uh, maybe a subtle, some smoldering infection going on in the base of the vein. So, so indirectly, the CSF was not really contributing towards any particular etiology, and we have to you know, go clinically. So if we go to the database, there is headache, there are cranial nerve palsies on the right side with some bilateral involvement of fifth and eighth, no weakness, no fever, no weight loss, which is very important in this case. And examination is revealing much more than the history, though this patient doesn't have dysphagia, he does have evidence of right ninth and tenth, meaning thereby that this may be a slow growing process. There is a compensation, patient never had dysphagia, so it is not something uh, acute, subacute, or a very catastrophic illness. It is a very smoldering kind of a disease, which is you know gradually picking up uh, the nerves one by one, and there is a compensation based on this history and examination. 
And uh, as I showed some of the representative pictures, the MRA is surely issuing a solid mass with dural thickening in the middle cranial fossa, which is extending interiorly into the orbit and over the clivus and petrous bone. I forgot to show some of that radiology, but it was going behind in the clivus region, which will be more evident in the next step. And the CT was showing the bony changes in the form of opomastoiditis and some sclerosis in few of the surrounding regions uh, where the disease pathology was. And uh, most of the workup, including CSF and IgG4, was negative, including ultrasound abdomen, CT chest and abdomen, and chest X-ray. So the intra-exil pathology is practically out based on history, examination, as well as the radiology. And now we are left, uh, now we have to struggle with the various disease, uh, disease processes, which are, you know, entrapping these cranial nerves at the base of the brain, either in the dura meter or in the skull bone or the space in between the two, or maybe outside the skull base. So with these multiple cranial nerve palsies, what could be the causes? Theoretically, you know, inflammatory diseases, infectious diseases, neoplastic diseases, paraneoplastic, vascular, traumatic, and uh, other bony disorders. They produce multiple cranial nerve palsies. And the biggest series of 979 cases of all kinds of cranial, multiple cranial nerve palsies shows tumors as one of the most common causes to the tumor, 30% followed by vascular disease, trauma, and infections. So here the tug of war is between tumors and infections in this patient. What is the pathology which is you know, encasing all these cranial nerves? That to selectively first on the right side and um, to some extent on the left side, there was some suggestion that there was a disease involvement even on the left side also in few of the images provided to me even in 2019. So if we come to the abnormal thickening of dura or dural enhancement, which was seen in this patient on MRI, so what are the various causes? The inflammatory causes like vasculitis, connective tissue disorders, jaw crunch, rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis, they can all lead to thickened dura matter and can cause all these cranial nerve palsies, which we have uh, discussed and encountered. But uh, in the wake of no you know, history of vasculitis, no joint pains, no oral ulcers, no skin lesions, no vasculitic infarcts in this patient, absolutely, that practically you know, takes me away from these inflammatory disorders. Then comes infectious disorders like bacterial, fungal, parasitic, viral, and many exotic infections can produce uh, this kind of dural changes. Then neuro and neoplastic diseases in the form of dural carcinomatosis, metastasis, lymphoproliferative disorders, including Langerhans, histiocytosis, B-cell lymphomas, and plaque meningiomas, lymphoplasmacytic rature, choroid meningiomas, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, rosary Dorfman disease, Iden Chester's disease and IgG4 related or idiopathic hypertrophic meningitis. So it's a huge, huge list. But invariably, the diagnosis is by biopsy in most of these disorders. Clinically, I can you know safely rule out inflammatory disease, though it may still rarely be there without any telltale sign of evidence elsewhere in the body. Infection is less likely in wake up. Absolutely, you know, one year the patient remains outside without any workup and without any treatment and uh, or maybe receiving some kind of steroids outside. We are not uh, uh, sure about that. I'm not being provided in the history. But the infectious causes without systemic features seems quite less likely, but I cannot totally rule it out. It had been seen that certain smoldering infections can go on for years together and uh, diagnosed later on something like chronic bacterial meningitis, syphilis, and tuberculosis, you know. So, but on the face value, in the absence of systemic symptoms, I will be, I will not be considering it as a strong possibility. So neoplastic remains an important possibility in this patient, though he is young and uh, dural carcinomatosis or metastasis going on for two years is quite unlikely, but uh, has to be considered in a CPC. And then lymphoproliferative disorders, I cannot rule it out. Then uh, IgG4 remained, uh, you know, quite favorite uh, amongst the neurologists treating there and amongst the neurologists treating here as a first possibility because all these changes could have been seen in a patient with multiple cranial nerve palsies without systemic symptoms 
and I think that was um, the favorite diagnosis offered uh, by the neurology team in Ames, and that too rightly so when the CSF is not showing anything anywhere. And um, so fungal pachymeningitis, I'm not considering because of the lack of infarcts. For two years, you know, patient surviving without uh, touching the brain is quite, or I'll, I'll say almost unlikely. And there is no sinus involvement, no breach in bone. Tuberculous pachymeningitis, which was considered in this patient, if we see the pictures, they can be a book picture, though pachymeningitis alone is very rare. And uh, you usually find evidence of tuberculosis elsewhere. The patient was uh, worked up for with Monto and other things, and they were all negative. And the CSF was also negative, which can be there in a pachymeningitis. So I cannot totally rule out with certainty this particular entity. And uh, then IgG4, you know, is an autoimmune disease. And again, only on biopsy that you find the triad of storyform fibrosis, lymphocytic infiltrates, and obliterated phlebitis on histopathology and uh, a large number of IgG4 positive plasma cells, more than 30, uh, 30 per hyperp, if that is what they say, which uh, clinches the diagnosis of, uh, of IgG4 related disease. And 30% uh, may not have any systemic involvement and IgG4 may be normal in good 45% of the patients. And you can have all these kinds of bony changes in the form of sclerosis or um, you know, uh, some uh, 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 all these bony changes in the vicinity of the dura mater, which is showing the disease process. So there can be re bony remodeling also with IgG4. So that remains a good possibility if we are considering the initial radiology and when the patient was initially admitted, then inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor is a kind of, um, you know, is a great mimicker of idiopathic hypertrophic pachy meningitis, but it is kind of a, a proliferative disorder. Uh, it produces, again, nodular or n plaque masses mimicking n plaque meningioma or other malignant tumors like lymphoma and manifest something the, in the same way as uh, this patient had. But the most common lesion is in orbits, which was there in our patient. They are solid, irregular, and well-defined masses, again, as seen in uh, our patient. But the diagnosis is mainly by immunohistochemistry. You can't make it clinically. You can only suspect it. So the suspicion remains strong. And same is true for rosoid Dorper disease, again, a lymphoproliferative disorder of uncertain origin. And central nervous system disease is very fair. And um, uh, again, immunohistochemistry gives you the diagnosis. Same is true for Arden Chester's disease, which is a non-Langerhans multi-system histiocytosis and systemic glycogranulomatous disorder with infiltration of lipid-laden histiocytes as is seen on biopsy. And they also have dural accumulations which uh, uh, mimic meningiomas. They have systemic involvement and they most of these patients present with uh, widespread bony pains and uh, uh, it will again be diagnosed only on histo immunohistochemistry and you can't just make it uh, clinically, except that if you're finding, you know, bony changes elsewhere in the body uh, clearly. And uh, so with this database and with this kind of uh, thought process, the patient received antifungals initially because that was a life-threatening disease. So he received 18 days of amphotericin. But later, based on the negative uh, workup, the patient was started on ATT with steroids. And after one month, it was tapered off. The patient did show, as per the record, some improvement, but the improvement was mainly some form of a, you know, improvement in facial numbness, but otherwise no vision improvement, which was not expected either, no improvement in the eye movement. So what kind of improvement was there is very questionable, but we take it in a positive way that this patient did have steroid responsive disease. But in November, the patient, uh, despite being on ATT and steroid tapering doses, had worsening of worsening with chewing difficulty. So the steroids were increased, and uh, and um, but later, you know, probably because of COVID, the patient stopped ATT steroids and uh, progressively worsened with leg weight loss and poor oral intake and became completely deaf. And in May, he had uh, left focal seizures with complete. Uh, loss of awareness and that was the time an outside MRI was done which had shown that the disease has ravaged the nervous system. There is you know, involvement of uh, 
extensive involvement now of the base of the brain with involvement bilaterally. If we can appreciate these signal changes and these masses which are present bilaterally, there is bilateral automestoiditis and there are you know, uh, changes that uh, there is an increase in the size of the lesion in the, in the uh, orbit also. And then there are some bulky muscles which are seen on the right side. And if we can appreciate the contrast enhanced images, look at the increase in the size of the mass which has involved the clinoid process also. And look, it is going right into the internal auditory meters. So where it is probably engulfing the seventh and the eighth nerve. And uh, you can appreciate that on the base of the brain, there is an extensive enhancement. And this is present anteriorly into the temporal lobe. And this is also extending onto the anterior side. So now we have bilateral disease with extensive basal involvement, extensive involvement on medial temporal lobe, bilateral cavernous sinuses going into the uh, into th through the superior orbital fissure into the orbit and also going inferiorly through the inferior orbital fissure into the structures lower down. And uh, this is another representative picture where I have tried to show both of the cavernous sinuses extensively involved going anteriorly, then laterally involving the muscles also, involving the bone also to some extent and going into the orbit. And if we can appreciate even the, the posteriorly, there is extensive informant the dura in front of the typhus, which we can better appreciate in this, that look at the disease, look at the disease that is going right into the cella tarsica, going into the orbits and uh, uh, in the base of the brain, along the clivers, behind in the dura, and possibly also uh, in the inferior infratemporal region, if we can appreciate all these in this radiology, in this hash view. Now, mind you, this is two years after the onset of the symptoms. So it is a relentlessly progressive disease which started on the right side, invaded the Mary's cranial nerves, and uh, then went on to the opposite side also. So during the second admission, this patient uh, was again admitted in August 2020. And uh, at that time, repeat MRI means also revealed the same findings which I have already narrated. There is bilateral extensive involvement of the cavernous sinuses going up to the tentorium. And then you can appreciate the petrocliver, uh, the dura behind. And uh, also, uh, there is some enhancement of the, uh, of the, of the cella tarsica and the um, and the whole of the cella is showing the similar kind of enhancement as that of the uh, lesion on both the sides. And we can better appreciate it, the, the clival uh, lesion, just look at it, the thick sheet of uh, whatever is in the, around the dura and look at it is trying to encase the basilar also and uh, uh, the internal carotid on the right side. But mind you, the I the MRNG was showing just a bit of kinking. There is no invasion. And, uh, and um, they tried to do the perfusion also, which was showing that some of these the areas were showing hyperperfusion. How much to interpret is uh, Dr. Ajay's domain. So I'll go further. The most interesting was the, so we had an extensive disease involving bilaterally. And uh, then the, one of the beautiful investigations are the FTG PET, if you can appreciate, there is extensive, extensive uptake in the base of the skull, not only the base of the skull, the whole of the skull and all the soft tissue below also, look at it. And there are these two lung forms which are you know, popping up and somewhere here, it is probably the inferior uh, part of the nasal septum, which is also showing some degree of uptake. And there was some uptake in the elite bone, if we can appreciate this, and the lymph nodes, if we can appreciate carefully on these pictures, which I'm able to better show you. Just look at it. The whole of the lesion, which was intensely enhancing on MRI, is showing hypermetabolism with an SU of close to 30, 33, meaning that thereby the all of the bone is hyperactive, all of the disease process is hyperactive. It is involving all the bones in its vicinity, even in the temporal 
bone, the, the sphenoid bone and the petrous apex, the clivus and everything is ravished with whatever is the disease process. And not only this, it is, you know, just engulfing everything which is there in its uh, domain. So look at it, the bone, the, the area behind the clivus and all the bone at the base of the brain, they are all showing extensive, extensive changes on FTG pet. There is hypermetabolism everywhere. So the disease process is just not confined to dura. That is what I want to emphasize. It is involving the bone as well as the infratemporal region also and going right up to the just look at it. The whole of the region uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, showing uh, evidence of uh, extensive hypermetabolism. So it is not only the base of the brain, it is in the nasopharyngeal region also that the patient is showing extensive hypermetabolism. And this can be appreciated even in this also. Now look at it carefully. There is fraying of the bone. There are changes in the clivus, hypersclerotic. There are changes in the temporal bone. There are changes almost everywhere in the bone, if we can appreciate. And they're all sclerosed and infiltrated. The marrow is completely replaced by, you know, some funny kind of a pathology, which is, you know, just relentlessly progressing to involve the various structures at the base of the brain and in the CNS. And uh, this is just to show that uh, this is not only confined to the bones itself, uh, but it is also, you know, metastasizing to the lymph nodes. Look at the right lymph nodes. So there is some neoplastic process at the base of the brain, which started way back in March 2018, and then progressed to involve, you know, locally the, all the structures which were there. And uh, so, Coming to the index uh, case summary, we have a patient who had extensive involvement of the disease process on the skull face, more in the middle cranial fossa and going into the infratemporal fossa with diffuse dural based soft tissue packing meningitic process involving cavernous sinus on both sides and extending to the lateral cavernous dura towards temporal complex these pentorium dura, orbital apex, intraorbital extension on right side with bony changes all along the base of the bone livers, mastoid, all phenomena, sphenoids, and there is no suggestion of injury in patient with any distal infection seen. There is increase in the size and uh, relentless progression on follow-up MRIs, and the PET CT is showing hypermetabolism to the SUV of 33, showing it is nothing but a malignant condition all the way, which has also gone on to the cervical lymph nodes and maybe to the right iliac bone. So going back to the previous CT, if we can carefully appreciate there were bony changes even uh, in this patient uh, uh, on the, uh, in, if we can appreciate in the clivus, there are some marrow changes going on on the right side. And uh, another important point, which I want to highlight is that look at the automestroiditis in this patient, which was there right uh, at the time of presentation. And there was, uh, uh, I'll show in the next, there was an infiltration of the eustachian tube. I think this is the, the one I wanted to show. Look at the beautiful eustachian tube, which is there on the left side, and look at the, uh, the entrapment of the eustachian tube, which led to this automestroiditis on the right side. So probably there was uh, a lingering pathology somewhere it, in 2019 also in the base of the brain, which has progress both intracranially as well as extracranially through the various foramina and through the fissures and through the bone. So let us combine all this um, 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 uh, 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 information together. So we had multiple cranial nerve palsies without any systemic features. We had CT and MRI, which was doubtfully showing hyperperfusion, but there was areas of enhancement all along. And then FTG PEC was showing hypermetabolism, which with lymph node metastasis. So I personally feel it is some kind of a malignancy, which was, you know, there right from the word go, uh, whether it was some kind of a lymphoma or a nasopharyngeal carcinoma based on the radiological facts which I have shown to you. So it is more of a clinical radiological uh, CPC rather than a clinical CPC. We could only localize the 
the question was no fever and no weight loss. So this is a red flag for everything. And then there was an improvement on steroids, which may probably favor some kind of a lymphoma, which was which responded uh, to steroids initially, but uh, later the the because of the lack of proper treatment, the patient can, can show improvement. And then I have to be cautious regarding the hyperperfusion, and there was no diffusion restriction, which I have not shown. There was minimal diffusion restriction, whether it was an artifact that Dr. Ajay can clarify in. Uh, after me, and then there was a definite hypermetabolism through and through in the, all the areas which I have shown to be pathological, and there was eustachian tube blockage, and uh, subsequently both the eustachian tubes were blocked, meaning thereby that there was a, a severe infiltrative disorder going on in the in the nasopharynx also, and the nasopharynx and the retron. Uh, Pingel space was extensively bulky with bony changes and involvement uh, uh, and um, involvement of the clitoris and other bones. So uh, while we were discussing all this uh, pet, we uh, you know just had reported one patient of you know cranial vault lymphoma, where we found similar kind of you know sclerosis as well as you know thickening of the bones and uh, uh, and uh, the patient was showing similar kind of uh, like, but this was a mass not in the bone, but in the there was a lack for some mass. So, but showing similar kind of you know bony changes and similar kind of uptake on uh, on uh, on um, uh, FDG PET. So I was thinking, uh, what to make now? So I have zeroed down to some kind of uh, malignancy, but I'm not sure whether I should keep lymphoma or an esophageal carcinoma as my is my first possibility, but uh, then, you know, the steroid responsiveness, if I have to take it, it favors lymphoma, but uh, there are no B uh, signs in the form of uh, symptoms in the form of fever, weight loss and other things, which is, you know, a bit uh, odd for lymphoma, but it can be there in, it cannot be there in one third of the patients. So I was looking at the literature. They said that the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, by you know, the statistics, nasopharyngeal carcinoma definitely is much more than in this region than the lymphoma. But uh, as per um, one of the papers, there are certain differences. If there is tumor invasion of the levator, the tensor villi, the longus coli, the medial pterygoid muscles, the base of pterygoid process, the clivus the base and greater wing of sphenoid, the petrous apex, the foramen lacerum, foramen avail, hypoglossal canal, and intracamalicular infiltration, it favors nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Like in this patient, what has happened is that uh, all these structures have been involved in our case. So again, you know, the tug of war between uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma versus some kind of a nasopharyngeal lymphoma, oral durable based lymphoma, the problem was that um, uh, as per the literature, the primary non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which represents 18 to 13 percent, 35 percent of the Vardier swing lymphomas around the nasal pharynx, and um, uh, in contrast, uh, it is associated with absence or minimal extent of tumor invasion compared to nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which has the propensity to invade all the structures which I already enumerated. So, so. At the end, I would just say that it was a teamwork of um, us with the nuclear medicine people and the radiologists. And of course, I'm sure the final word is the pathologist. My final diagnosis after all this discussion remains that there were multiple cranial palsies clinically in this patient, possibly related to infiltration by some kind of a malignancy. My first possibility based on the literature and none of my experience is nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And that Lymphoproliferative disorder still, you know, as a neurologist, I would love to make this diagnosis more because of the steroid responsiveness and because we hardly ever see an esophageal carcinoma in our day-to-day -day setup, uh, query a large B-cell carcinoma with a dural or a mesopharyngeal region, but based on literature, mesopharyngeal carcinoma is the first possibility. Infection remains unlikely going on for two years with so much of ATT already received and not showing any any kind of infarcts or invasion, and such a high degree of hypermetabolism on FDG PET is 
very very unlikely and if it turns out to be some kind of an exotic infection it will be a major learning point for all of us and with this i conclude and uh, thank you all for the patience listening i'm sure dr sharma will be polite enough if it turns out to be some kind of infection and can you know um, um can take care of uh, ej in a very gentle way so with this i conclude my discussion and uh, hand over the uh the discussion to professor sharma and the team thank you once again thank you dr modi uh you have left no place for the pathologist but i have one question if suppose you have to order some biopsy from there you will uh, okay uh, the biopsy was taken from a site which is you know showing intense uh, enhancement as well as from the uh from there the ftg pet is extensive but at the same time look at the nasopharynx extensively it is much less invasive i would have uh, you know if i had discussed this uh, radiology before the biopsy i would have definitely asked the ent surgeon to take it from the nasopharynx rather than open up the skull but um, probably a, a biopsy as i confirmed from dr manjil yesterday a uh, fnc was probably taken earlier also from the skull Uh, but it was probably non-conclusive. Otherwise, probably not showing anything. Otherwise, you know, diagnosis could have been clinched. So, taking biopsy from the area where it has been taken was nothing wrong. But uh, looking at overall, it is much easier to take a nasopharyngeal biopsy compared to a uh, brain biopsy or the dural biopsy where you had to open the skull and uh, take the large chunk of tissue. That is what I think. I think last biopsy which we would have been taken from the lymph node, if we know that the lymph node is there, right? Sir. Would have been better. But actually, lymph node was detect, uh, detected later on. Yes. Only if they have taken the biopsy, and the biopsy was a little bit failure in the initial stages. Thank you very much for discussing. Any question to Professor Modi? May I invite the treating uh, unit? What was their impression? So this patient had a rather uh, long hospital course. During the first hospitalization, uh, we had mentioned that a diagnostic procedure was done. So I would like to uh, shed some light on that part. So the initially when the uh, biopsy was planned, uh, it was done from the right uh, temporal hole where there was intense enhancement. But that uh, biopsy was actually non-contributory uh, because the patient was continuing to have lesions and the patient was uh, started on ATT and steroids. We we had planned to uh, look for the response. After a few months, there was some uh, subtle response to steroids and we had started uh, tapering. but once the steroids had been started to uh, once the steroid had been tapered we found that uh, the lesions were actually uh, increasing both clinically as well as on imaging uh, that was the point of time when we had readmitted and uh, at that time the diagnosis of malignancy was high on the card so apart from the diagnosis that you had discussed uh, based on the osteosclerosis we had also considered other possibilities like myeloma osteosclerotic myeloma and uh, also paget disease also we had considered and we had worked up for the same but ultimately uh, as we know the pathology gave us the final diagnosis ent evaluation ent evaluation sir uh, she had rightly pointed out uh, the patient had uh, uh, automastoiditis and we had also mentioned that the patient had right sided ear discharge so as you rightly said uh, the nasopharyngeal uh, lesion we had thought about it and a complete ent evaluation was done uh, the diagnostic nasal endoscopy and the direct examination of the uh, nasopharynx did not reveal any lesions at that point of time and the imaging also uh, was not suggestive of i mean uh, the uh, lumen of the nasopharynx did not have any proliferative lesion which could be biopsy at that point of
Like to this uh, patient, 27 year old, duration of three years, he had he has multiple uh, nerve palsies. I think the clinical diagnosis at the time was the infective sarcoidosis or IgG4 later disease. And uh, they did the biopsy. First, they sent the frozen section, which shows fibroblasin tissue. And maybe there's some inflammatory cells, but uh, we said this is an active in the frozen. I think this is only the uh, apex temporal bone. Low, low, I dural wax. It was from the temporal uh, inferior. Then there was uh, these are routine sections. There shows fibrocolagenous tissue. There is some inflammation, and there is one uh, nerve also. Big nerve is ordered in the biopsy, and uh, we couldn't give any diagnosis. This, this one, in the fibroblastic tissue, there was a lot of uh, adhesion probably, and uh, it was negative. So, was this is the first biopsy. Now, retrospectively also, I thought, um, I always believed that uh, CPC is a good way of audit or routine working. It's for the benefit of the patient for future learning. I thought uh, I should, uh, I did the cytokeratin stain on this, rather I have made a mistake, but it was uh, negative. So probably this was not a representative of the lesion. Then, uh, oh. So this is the first biopsy, which was non-contributory. So then we got the second biopsy after a year. And I think that this time, uh, Ila was very sure that she has written the tuberculosis, sarcoidosis by name. But uh, another addition was the iodine chest disease. So we tried to rule out all these conditions. And there was another CSF. I think twice CSF was done. It was showing only the inflammatory cells, lymphocyte, no malignant cells were seen. So this is the biopsy. This shows a lot of uh, crush artifacts. There is a lot of fibrosis. Probably this is a dura. And these are a little bit uh, more bival areas. It just composed uh, sheets of these cells with the hyperchromatic to vesicular nuclei, a lot of mitosis. And it would win, uh, there may be some inflammation. So this is another magnification. So this is a, more like a sheet like more like a carcinoma. One bone well was also sent at that time. And this is the, there is some fibrosis in between the trabeculae. This is the mucosa lining. So biopsy was very adequate and there was no carcinoma in C2 or dysplastic changes in the mucosa lining. Although this was not the proper uh, nasopharyngeal uh, biopsy. So a lot of conditions were considered some of them are very newly described. So as a pathologist, we always are interested in the more rare conditions rather than the commons. And we did, uh, all of them have a very characteristic uh, features, but there is a lot of overlap also in the morphology. So Dr. Kavneet was involved. She has done a wonderful job. 
the first was was uh, a rhabdoid variant of the or what you call the the ini1 deficient uh, neurofibrillar carcinoma this was a positive normally so if there is loss then it is a neurofibrillar carcinoma ini1 loss of the smart one deficient the neuroendocrine tumor was ruled out because it was an active or promogran in synaptofysin the other was the midline nut carcinoma which is also described in the midline it may be in the nasopharynx or in the mediastinum or in the other places younger uh, populations this highly aggressive carcinoma but it does a very characteristic uh, staining translocation this antibody is available and it shows uh, more than 90% positivity so this was uh, ruled out and uh, because this uh, mic2 was positive so even sarcoma the adamantum adamantinoma like even sarcoma was the other possibility so she did the translocation for 1122 fish that was an active so this was uh, also ruled out but on the other hand this tumor was positive for cytokeratin pan cytokeratin low molecular high molecular uh, p40 was positive it is also the marker for this common cell so probably this is a common cell carcinoma and the this uh, evv virus lmp which is a immunostochemistry was uh, done at that time it was positive and uh, it was uh, repeated twice both time was positive and later on i did the eva which is more specific uh, sensitive for the evv virus dr somer and he has done this is a nuclear possibility so this confirmed that it is some lesion which is uh, evv associated so finally we are diagnosed as non keratinized squamous cell carcinoma under prenzel nasopharyngeal carcinoma stage 4 because it is involving the the earlier there was many name given to this entity lymphoepithelioma which is a misnomer because it is not the tumor of the lymphoid tissue which is a innocent a innocent bystander the some people say that the lymph it is a lot of lymphocytes but in some cancer this carcinoma you get the lymphocyte plasma cells eosinophils multinucleated giant cells so this and this uh, terminology is uh, now obsolete and uh, going back the classically nasopharyngeal carcinoma which are associated with the epstein barr virus they show a lot of lymphocytes now this tumor has some lymphocytes when we did the leukocytic common antigen but it's not like the classical the one of the reason could be that uh, this patient has received lot of uh, steroid which has affected the the lymphocytic component so by going the staging is very very important in this tumor because the treatment depends upon the prognosis depends upon the stage especially the prognosis this tumor was infiltrating into the intracranial structure so this is a and at that time i don't think uh, someone has looked for the lymph node because this this the pet was done in the last uh, 2000 20 so probably lymph node was uh, maybe missed or they may develop later on the metastasis probably develop later on this is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma is a, more common in asian country especially in china hong kong india also some cases are described especially from the more in the northeast nagaland manipur mizoram and uh, it has uh, by model peak one is younger children the another peak is in the older individual and interestingly one fifth of these cases they develop in children so any child with uh, if you suspect the carcinoma look for the cervical lymph node if the cervical lymph node is also involved most likely this is a metastasis from the nasopharyngeal carcinoma male are more commonly vector than female and the most common because it arises from the lateral wall of the nasopharynx it um, this blocks the this opening of the middle ears so otitis hearing loss and uh, cranial nerve involvement is very very common cervical lymph nodes are very common 
if you in the radiology you find the asymmetry of the nasopharynx or irregular thickening sometimes there may not be any grossly the there not be any growth the mucosa may be normal or sometimes it may be just irregular uh, mucosa and uh, in those instances if you do the mri in the mri if it is irregular thickening and there are lymph nodes the most likely one should go for the earlier people used to call it as a blind biopsy but now the endoscopic biopsy from the blind means the people take uh, because in the mucosa normally you take biopsy from the different area from the lateral uh, nasopharynx and in 70% of the cases people say they you will find the and this is one of the tumor where you don't get the carcinoma in situ although it starts from the epithelium so in uh, cases where there is a uh, the biopsy is first biopsy is negative and should repeat the biopsy nasopharyngeal carcinoma is classified now according to who into the non keratinizing which may be differentiated or undifferentiated actually undifferentiated is a more of misnomer misnomer it is common cell carcinoma but the differentiated is the one which show little bit uh, keratin and the keratinized is common cell carcinoma is the second most common but the difference between the two is that uh, Keratinizing is more commonly associated with the smoking and uh, HPV viral infection. Where this one, non-keratinizing is associated with the Epstein Barr virus. And very, very rarely there can be basaloid squamous cell carcinoma. The most common etiology for this I have mentioned is the Epstein Barr virus, but uh, there are some environmental factors and uh, especially the salted fish, which contain some of the chemical nitrosa means uh, human papilloma is rarely associated and uh, if the human papilloma virus is positive the most likely people say that it may be extension from the oropharynx rather than the true nasopharyngeal carcinoma and uh, in the the area where it is very in, uh, incidence is very high it may is associated with the sum of the hla genes and uh, LMP1 and 2 are the most commonly associated with the, the latent membrane protein genes which are associated with the nasopharyngeal carcinoma lot of malignancies have been described associated with the Epstein Barr virus but there some of the lymphoma and uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma it is proven now just like the lymphoma it start from the, this virus in fact the the epithelium normally it causes the lytic effect so the cell will die but sometime it will remain dormant and uh, whenever there is uh, some alter in the immunity it reactivate and it causes the rona proliferation and ultimately to tumor formation now epstein barr virus is the best uh, initiator but it may not be sustained for the progression probably there are some other genes other uh, genetic pathway which gets involved later on and uh, nf kappa is the one which is commonly involved in the epstein barr virus associated nasopharyngeal carcinoma and this is the nf kappa and is involved in the inflammation and this is maybe the reason that this tumor is commonly associated with the lot of lymphocytic reaction of the other inflammatory cells it has some other uh, importance also because a uh, lot of uh, now people are uh, trying vaccine for the nasopharyngeal carcinoma they are trial they are effective the only concern is about the safety as these many times these uh, children are young so the young people the long term effects are not uh, known that is the one worry otherwise the vaccine is also tried in the cases of uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma now ct mri and pet are the best as i mentioned the mri node is the best whenever there is irregular uh, nasopharyngeal thickening and the lymph nodes but the markers are also available you can do in the blood these uh, antibody data which is helpful or rather in the follow up these cases and uh, recurrence to so monitor the recurrence of these in the csf also this can be measured in the csf one can do the the cytology for cancer cells When I put for the pachymeningeal meningitis, intracranial tumors, and metastasis is the second most common cause of the 
and in the metastasis the large number of cancers are described breast prostate and lung are the most common and i think in the fourth is the head and neck cancers but the nasopharyngeal carcinoma as such is the least common but this type of dural involvement which is through the foramina through the peridural invasion is common especially in this case uh, the other differential diagnosis should be adenoid cystic carcinoma which which travel along the nerves mm -hmm. the meningeal carcinomatosis in this case as is the same pattern people have described the meningeal carcinomatosis the csf uh, spread in this uh, rarely in this tumor and uh, these prognosis depend upon the stage so this staging is very important radiotherapy and chemotherapy is the treatment of choice the lymph node metastasis is the bad prognostic uh, in uh, from this irch uh, they have published i was also co author in the in the children they have uh, 41 children but they were not uh, properly investigated for the epstein barr virus there were some positive but it is mostly from the northeast a lot of literature from the northeast it's common in the northeast so in malaysia from there is common one there is one study delaying the diagnosis and what they have mentioned that uh, because of the doctors 127 days and especially when the patient who present with the middle ear problems they the diagnosis is usually delayed and it has goes to 144 days so sometime as when you have to repeat the biopsy the delay is uh, because of the ignorance but they are recommending that uh, it should be taught in the undergraduate classes because it is very common in china malaysia singapore now so just to conclude nasopharyngeal carcinoma is associated with epstein barr virus it has bimodal peak low original spread intracranial common pacimenial thickening is rare and uh, this is one of the from the neurologist point of view 12% of the cases of dermatomyositis which are associated with the underlying malignancy nasopharyngeal carcinoma is a and the common uh, the cervical lymph node biopsy blind biopsy if it is not endoscopic even it is uh, helpful in any case when uh, the there are changes in the mri or their cervical lymph node and sometime it uh, mimics the hodgkin lymphoma i remember two cases where they were diagnosed pathologically as the nodular sclerosis and when they were not responding and we did the cytokeratin staining it was positive even it is further in this complicated in 10% of the cases these cells are positive for cd30 which is the marker for the hodgkin the granulomatous selection sometime we have we have it in the tumor um, in india because it is a common condition for example if someone is having nasopharyngeal carcinoma in the cervical lymph node in the follow up we always call it as a tumor closer but people have described in the western literature that uh, some of the case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma they can have the granulomatous selection in the cervical lymph node and it may be sometime necrotizing so one should be very careful to label these cases as the now this type of uh, thyroid process uh, sclerosis as is in this case in one of the study they have shown that 60% of the cases yes. when they compared to the control for other reason the sclerosis is common but they recommend that it should be included in the staging and in this case they also because they have not done biopsy for every patient so they also recommend that uh, it may be fibrosis or it may be the tumor infiltration when there is a bony erosion or destruction we take it as a stage 3 but when there is closure it is not taken as a t3 so but they recommend that it should be up stages because of this closure so whatever was in this case i think this power point was more in favor of uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma in the who there is a large series but they have described the cavernous sinus 16% of the cases so in this case also we have the cavernous sinus in this series uh, about uh, 27% of the cases show the cavernous sinus involvement <laughs> uh now if someone say i don't know he has shown the there is a growth in the nasopharynx i am sure that this is from the nasopharynx but suppose if it is not from the nasopharynx then what could be the other this kind of carcinoma has been described from the what is nasopharynx the other end is the rectum similar tumor has been described in the other places 
So if it is not uh, nasopharyngeal, it can be from the metastasis from the other side also. So one should be careful differential diagnosis is many, but in a proper setup, I think with the markers, they all can be ruled out. So I'm, uh, this was actually a case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, I think, but uh, at that time, we have not written the nasopharyngeal. We have written the carcinoma, poorly differentiated carcinoma, but positive for the LMP. The Somair engine, he did the this Epstein Barr virus, uh, the staining, RNA staining. Dr. Anchar Kakkar, she's involved in the CPC. Kavneet Kaur, she was involved in the case. Dr. Ajay Garak, Department of Neurology and uh, Ilavasi. I cannot uh, finish without your uh, acknowledging you. Thank you. Sir, any questions? Sir? Thank you, sir. It was wonderful. Yes. Congratulations, Manish. <laughs> Congratulations to the team TGI. You know, where this was only a radiological diagnosis. Clinically, you have to just fit the things together. That's it. So I this, time, this time, we have not hidden anything. We have given you the even PET scan. <laughs> and probably that helps. Yeah, otherwise, it is difficult. You know, the, the neurologist uh, will remain just above the base of skull. They never go down. But, you know, one or two things I would like to, you know, still emphasize uh, that uh, young male who is presenting with otomestroiditis and multiple cranial nerve palsies, look for, you know, evidence of eustachian tube involvement. I showed in 2019 also it was missed. There was a infiltrative pathology, which was, you know, infiltrating the eustachian tube on the right side, clearly compared to the left side. And that was possibly the cause of otomestroiditis in this patient. And that was a soft pointer towards the origin of the disease from that area, I would like to say. So that was something, you know, which uh, repeatedly I had been discussing with my radiology team and, uh, and uh, that look back and see if it was there earlier also, because we were not sure whether the disease is going from up to down or from down to up. So finally, we thought that um, nasopharynx was initially involved. There was no phenomena. I could see where the things are going from various foramina in the dura into the temporal region on both sides. So things were becoming a bit difficult to explain. But once we found that the nasopharynx is a bit bulky and it is infiltrating the eustachian tubes, probably that uh, let us make uh, things easier. So confusion, as I already told, was more between lymphoma and nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So I had to you know, read a bit of literature. And there were many things, you know, which you encounter, which most of these are seen actually by neurosurgeons. That's why we are not um, very good at diagnosing these malignancies. Most of them with mass lesions, they go to neurosurgeons, they do the biopsy or excision and, um, and the diagnosis remain with them only. So it is only by sheer luck that uh, patient was admitted in neurology, but uh, somehow because I still feel that um, uh, we should, you know, keep on knocking at uh, radiologists' door time and again to, you know, ask for what is there, what is there, what is there, and maybe they sleep from there. Um, <laughs> they uh, they wake up from the sleeping posture and uh, you know show you look this bone is also sclerosed now, which was not in the first discussion. It was not there. Look, there is a bony change here also. Look, there is a bony change there also. So disease is not confined just to the dura. There is bone involvement. There is muscle involvement downstairs also. So, you know, if you're not able to explain, probably, you know, keep on discussing with your colleagues and um, for a neurologist, radiologist is the best friend and they should be befriended even uh, under all adverse circumstances. That is what I feel. And thank you very much, sir, for this excellent diagnosis. So that is the reason we always have a CPC for these cases, so we can learn from the learned yes. people like you. In future, I think now no one will make this uh, mistake. <laughs> Probably, yes, sir. Thank you Thanks. once again. Thank you. To the neurology team for giving me this uh, opportunity. Thank you once again.
Thank you, sir. It's late. Okay, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feel anything?